Grace and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Every one of us at one time or another got chewed out by our parents, right? If they love us at all, they'll at least once in a while get in our grill and really let us know what we've done wrong. God, our Heavenly Father, our first parent, is no different from earthly parents. He gets in the face of his people more than once and chews them out because they have departed from where they should be going. They're not doing the things they should do. They're not thinking the things they should speak. They're not saying the things they should say. He levels an indictment against them today through his prophet Micah. He calls the creation itself, the mountains and the hills, to be witness. Hear ye mountains, you enduring foundations of the earth. The Lord has an indictment against his people. Now, my dad would have had to be really angry with me to use a word like indictment, even when I was old enough to understand what indictment meant. And God is really angry with his people. This is a formal legal challenge to their way of life. His indictment is, first of all, the relationship with him. My people, what have I done to you? That's more sometimes like a mom thing that we hear. Why are you breaking my heart, child? What have I done to deserve this? Dads will pull that card out once in a while, but I think most of us heard something like that more from our mothers. It's just the way we were. Dads were usually more right in your face. and He'll get to that. How have I wearied you? Answer me. Perhaps even a bit of sarcasm in there. We all love when we can come up with a good sarcastic remark, but we pretty much hate it when somebody uses it against us. What have I done to deserve the way you treat me? You rotten, worthless children. I brought you up from the land of Egypt, redeemed you from the house of slavery. I sent before you Moses, Aaron, Miriam. Oh, my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. What happens from Shittim to Gilgal that you may know the saving acts of the Lord? I got that sometimes too. I put food on the table. I give you a roof over your head. I get you your clothes. Once in a while, I'll let you get something off of the candy aisle in the grocery store. Whatever it was, I heard that too. And in one way or another, so did you. But this is more than just casual misbehavior or once in a while doing something that the parents don't really want us to do. This is ingrained habit. And he sets it up with all the good things he's done for them. And like so many places in the Old Testament, he starts with the Exodus, with the Passover, with the death of the firstborn, which is implied in here before how he brought them up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery and then sent Moses and Aaron and Miriam, his sister and his brother-in-law, assisting the prophet as they got Israel safely out of Egypt and into the wilderness on their way to the promised land. Did I do anything wrong by you, by saving you from a lifetime of servitude, by rescuing you, by keeping you as a people where Pharaoh would have slowly and completely dismantled this nation? And then during the Exodus... Balak, king of Moab, wanted the prophet Balaam to curse the Israelites. And you remember what happened with that, right? It's one of the lessons, if you went to Sunday school at all, it sticks in you so much because how many places in the Bible does an animal talk? But there, Balaam's donkey sees the angel of the Lord that's there to smite him, but the prophet doesn't because... The donkey is more in tune with the true God than the man who is proceeding along the road with him. And sometimes that's us too. Maybe our critters know more about God and a good relationship with him than we do. But the donkey balked. And Balaam tried to even beat him to get him going. And the donkey warned him what was going to happen if they kept going. God 
not only stopped him from cursing his people, but instead he moved the prophet Balaam into making a blessing for the people. And there wasn't anything that the king of Moab could do about it. Because when God intervenes on behalf of his people, what he wants done gets done. All of these things in. And he could have listed a lot more. The time on Sinai, the giving of the law, the organizing of the tribes and the mapping out of the lands that they were going to inherit when they finally crossed over, the crossing into the new land with Joshua and so many other things, all of the walls of Jericho. But this is enough. This reminds them of everything that went before and everything that follows. I've done all this for you. And what have you done and what are you doing to and for me? And then, from speaking in the Lord's voice, the prophet turns around and gives voice to God's people. And these words don't stop with Israel, although they were first pointed at them. These could be our words also. How do we respond to God when he points out our sins? Our misdeeds, our faults, our weaknesses, whether of body, of mind, of mouth, of spirit, those things that we do that are not right in the Lord's eyes. Pastors don't come into the pulpit to call out their members individually. That's between you and God, but we are here to call out all of God's people collectively. And then let each one of you line up who you are and what you've done with who God wants you to be and what God wants you to be doing. And if you don't see that you fall short in one way or another, then you need to hear God's indictments all over again. Because he's rescued you. Instead of bringing you through the Red Sea waters, he brought you through the waters of baptism. Instead of sending Moses and Miriam and Aaron, although through the scriptures we still have them, he sends Christian parents and pastors and teachers now. He continues to provide those people to speak on his behalf, and we continue to hear them when we want to and disregard them when we feel like it, right? We need that interrupted. We need that chain broken, and that's what God has done. And now the prophet responds on behalf of all of Israel and on behalf of us, with what shall I come before the Lord? How do I respond to a God who is really and legitimately angry with me? Bow myself before God on high. Shall I come before him with bird offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Those were the customary sacrifices, or some of them yet, at least in tabernacle and in temple. It didn't list all of them because there wasn't enough time or space, but those are some of the big ones. And then, on behalf of Israel, and on behalf of you and me, he puts these words in our mouths in our response to God. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Shall I sacrifice my own child? And this goes back to Egypt, doesn't it? When the Lord sent the angel of death through the land, and only those with the blood of the lambs painted over their doors were spared the death of their firstborn. And now, should I go back and sacrifice my firstborn, even though my parents back in Egypt didn't lose theirs when God came through and cleaned house? Shall I? He's told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Which is a good summary of what you just heard in what we call the Beatitudes, those words from Matthew 5 about how you're blessed. How you're blessed in your relationship with God and with one another. But how do you get to that state? How do you become somebody who is in a blessed state when you have made such a mess out of your life to date? When you have not kept all of God's commandments and rules and regulations? Have you even done justice, loved kindness, and walked humbly with God in everything that you have done? If you have, then you don't need to be here today except to sing praises to the Lord. But you haven't, I haven't, none of us has. And the biggest thing is the 
sacrifices are being lined up here. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? My firstborn can't die for my sins and yours can't for yours. Nobody who is born to you nor you yourself can die and atone for all of your sins. You can die because of your sins, but that's as far as it goes according to God's law. God knows that you can't offer a sacrifice that will completely and absolutely blot out everything wrong in you and with you. So what does God do? He offers his firstborn as your sacrifice. He offers the death of Jesus on the cross instead of your eternal divorcement and death from God. This just jumped off the page when I was looking at this week's readings. Shall I give up my firstborn for my transgression? He switched that back to God's words then. Shall I give up my firstborn for your transgression? Why, yes, I shall. Because that's the only thing that's going to fix the problem, the root problem of sin, of guilt, and of judgment. The soul that sins will surely die, no exceptions. One sin is not only the indictment, but also then brings the sentence of death. Death, not only as in ceasing breathing and being turned to your grave, but death as an eternal loss of the presence of God and abandonment in torment forever. God doesn't say a lot about hell in the scriptures because usually he's more concerned with how you're doing right now and what lies ahead for those who believe, but that's in the back of all of it. Death does not end the punishment for the wicked. But death, the death of Jesus, ends the punishment for those who believe in him for those truly righteous. And now we can inherit the blessings that God gives to the righteous person. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. Be poor in spirit, be hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Pull it out from Old and New Testament alike and all those wonderful blessings that God gives for the right attitude and the right behavior toward God and toward one another. God counts that as your righteousness because Jesus did those things for you. And then suffered and died because you couldn't do it for yourself. He offers his firstborn so that we would not be born to die forever, but right, rather be born and then be born once again, born from above in baptism and live with him forever and ever and ever. Now, just because I can't atone for my sins in the things that I respond to God with doesn't mean that I don't respond to God. Rather than in fear trying to throw enough stuff at God to buy him off now, because he has bought me off, because he has paid for all of my transgressions, I am free to respond to him. We have an offering plate that we can put money into to help the work of this church and the mission of the church Let's spread farther. We can do good in this community. We can do good for one another. We can stop and listen and pay attention to each other's hurts. And we can reach out and also then tend to the hurts of others in our larger circle. And even around the world as we help various charities with the poor and the hungry and those who have been displaced by war. And we can trust in God and we can love God and we can respond to his love for us with our love for one another and our lives of faith in him. Your firstborn Savior, firstborn from all eternity, the eternal begotten Son. So many different ways we say it. But at a specific time, the eternal Son of God became the Son of God, also then the Son of Man living on this earth. Flesh and blood, heart beating, lungs breathing, eating and drinking and laughing and crying and living a normal, ordinary human life, save for one thing, an abnormal lack of sin, which is actually the norm. We are all so twisted away, we don't realize that Jesus' perfection is the norm for all of us, but that's it. And he kept that norm, and he returns us to that norm. And in his forgiveness, we desire to go back to it, never completely fulfilling it, because we will remain weak and often foolish, 
until the day that we die, until we are finally raised up with new bodies and new minds and hearts that are fresh and clean and pure forever and ever. But know this, you do not have to offer a sacrifice to God, not even that precious sacrifice of your own dear child because he offered his own dear child for you. And now he invites you to participate in the joy of being his children, of being counted now among his firstborn, of being credited as being as righteous, as holy and pure as Jesus himself. And living that way now, as God guides and guards you until you live that way forever with the blessed sight of eternal life. God, keep you pure and blessed in spirit, desiring to do good for others and desiring to be faithful to your Lord above until he calls you to your eternal rest and your eternal joy with him. In the name of Jesus, God's firstborn and your Savior, amen. The peace that surpasses understanding keep you in Christ Jesus. Amen.